Thank you, everyone. Welcome to joining the second session of the working groups for operationalizing the regional action program on air pollution. We're very happy to have you all with us here today and, and look forward to a productive session. We'd like to uh, dive right in as we have a, a packed agenda for today. So we'll proceed now directly to the opening. Uh, I'm very pleased to introduce uh, Mr. Uh, Sangman Nam, the director of the Environment and Development Division, who will be giving his opening remarks. Over to you, Sangman. Thank you, Matthew. <clears throat> good afternoon, good morning, or good evening. Uh, thank you for your participation in this second working group on air quality standards and data. So we are really grateful for your participation in last meeting. I guess some of you were not in the last meeting, but uh, this uh, process has been really instrumental for us in defining priorities of our science-based uh, and policy-oriented cooperation. So with uh, your input, as you have seen the concept note and background note, we were able to identify priorities and present them to you for further discussion, on, especially on required actions regarding air quality standards, monitoring practice, collaboration among monitoring networks, communities of practice, and data sharing modalities. I mean, these priorities are part of our regional action program on air pollution, uh, which identifies 33 uh, recommended actions. However, we expect that these outcome of working groups will be critical foundation for building and strengthening science-based uh, policy-oriented cooperation, which is uh, the key goal of uh, this uh, wrap-up regional action program on air pollution. Also, we are really excited that uh, your recommendations will be also directly relevant and supporting the most recent uh, re resolution of the UN Environmental Assembly on promoting regional cooperation on air, air pollution, which was adopted just two weeks ago. And then done up from Climate and Clean Air Coalition uh, will be presenting today. And this uh, resolution calls on improving national air quality standards and setting goals of uh, regional, regional air quality improvement. So the adoption and implementation of this resolution also highlights the vital role of a regional cooperation in enhancing uh, national and global air quality. We are also encouraged that this intergovernmental process towards uh, adoption of our wrap-up was uh, uh, initiated of this global resolution. So this also reflects the significant progress and the value of our collective efforts in strengthening the foundation of cooperation on both regional and global levels. And such progress cannot be made your active participation in this multilateral process. We are well aware of various scientific communities, but through this process, we wish to bring your expertise into a multilateral process at the regional level and also global levels. So in, in, this, in light of this, uh, we really look forward to tangible outcomes and recommendations from today's meeting. Together, we can really build a stronger foundation for our regional cooperation. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much for those opening remarks, uh, Song Min. Uh, we're now happy to uh, turn the chair over to uh, Mushtaq Memnon, who will give the opening remarks from the side of UNEP. Mushtaq, go ahead. Thank you, Matthew. And uh, good afternoon, uh, colleagues and excellencies. And uh, I really uh, first would like to thank uh, United Nations Econ Economic and Social Commission uh, for Asia and the Pacific for inviting UNEP for, to speak at this really very important occasion. And big thanks to my mentor, Sangmin, and my friend, Matthew. And so as we see that uh, air pollution is one of the most uh, pressing environmental health crisis globally, and it's uh, worst in Asia Pacific, with we see that 70% is occurring the challenges globally in the region. And as uh, 
we saw the outcome of the sixth session of the U uh, United Nations Environment Assembly that concluded in February that uh, member states up, uh, agreed on a resolution on promoting regional cooperation on air pollution to improve air quality globally. So this is a really a, a good chance for us to come together in Asia Pacific, uh, especially to see where we have a lot of a challenge, let's say 70%. And so it really encourages uh, the countries in the region to set the national uh, ambient air quality. Uh, and also looking at the guidelines from the WHO on air quality as well. And as we see there's the good progress in a way that when we see that 66% of the countries have now ambient air quality standards set in their legislatives. Uh, but then still when we look at the implementation of those guidelines and even the uh, WHO guidelines uh, be, uh, before the 2021, still we are far away from there. So this is really, uh, I would see that UNSCAP has uh, put uh, everything together to help the member states in Asia Pacific to really look on the ambient air quality standards to also as UNEP developed the guidance on the ambient air quality legislation to assist the member states and the policymakers. So we are looking forward to work together with uh, everyone in leadership from UNSCAP under this uh, uh, regional action plan for Asia Pacific and also now under the UNIA resolution uh, from uh, six, uh, six Assembly, which talks about the uh, UNEPS to facilitate the cooperation network on air quality, working with all the regional mechanisms across the globe. So in Asia Pacific, we have quite a few very impressive, uh, in addition to wrap up, is uh, APCAP, it's a ENET, and uh, it's also the uh, for the Mali Declaration, which we are also trying to reignite as well. Uh, so I really would like to thank again uh, everyone here. And I will, uh, I'm sorry that uh, I'm in Tokyo. I couldn't join in person for this very important one as we are conducting a uh, quality related training. But uh, hopefully, end of May, we are working with UNSCAP for a major event in, in Bangkok. So looking forward to many of you seeing there. Thank you very much, Matthew and Sangman. Great. Thanks very much, uh, Mushtaq and, and Song Min, for your opening uh, introductory remarks. At this stage, it is, uh, it is my pleasure to provide a, a background orientation on this uh, process to operationalize the Regional Action Program. Um, I will be going through this background as, as quickly as feasible. Uh, we're very grateful for all of you for uh, giving from your time to join this process, and we want to have as much uh, time available for the open plenary as possible to hear from you and, and have your interventions. So I'm going to go quickly. Uh, if it's too quickly, uh, you can uh, refer to any of these slides in the reference materials after, after the meeting, but let's dive into it directly. Uh, as you can see on this uh, next slide, the uh, Regional Action Program has uh, five thematic areas. Um, in those uh, uh, verticals, we have been able to mobilize uh, voluntary contributions from the member countries to support taking the work forward, which has allowed us to move directly from uh, adoption of the agreement uh, straight into action. So we'll review briefly some of the actions that we've taken and where it is that we're going with that. On the next slide, you can see the uh, project portfolio that we have uh, at our uh, hands to work with at this stage uh, and demonstrates the, the different tracks that we'll be taking forward on this. Um, in particular, uh, the uh, building partnership and coordination platform for the Regional Action Program uh, will have a, a point on the agenda in uh, the working group on data, where we hope to receive your inputs on how we can move forward with that. Um, on our next slide shows uh, some highlights in the international events that we've had so far. Uh, with the passage of the wrap-up in December of 22, we moved immediately to the high-level forum on clean air in Mongolia to receive uh, inputs from member countries at technical and political levels on what uh, themes should be taken forward in action in the region. Uh, from there, we went into the International Day of Clean Air for Blue Skies in Bangkok in September of 2023, where we convened a number of uh, expert group meetings, uh, roundtables, and, and consultations to orient the work. 
uh, we're very pleased to have implemented in October of 23 in uh, conjunction with the Asia Pacific Urban Forum in Suwon, uh, one of our thematic expert group meetings on uh, air pollution data and uh, gender. So uh, later on, when we start getting into the real meat of the, the working groups, I'll describe how those uh, products and events are all fitting together towards uh, where we want all of this to go. Uh, so if we could uh, look at the consultation timeline, uh, I'd like to highlight for everyone's awareness uh, how we'll be taking this consultative process forward into the intergovernmental process. So please uh, mark your calendars for these upcoming events. Obviously, we're starting out today here on the uh, 13th of March with the uh, working group consultations today. Uh, you have all received the uh, draft discussion background document in preparation for today's session, which highlighted each one of the priorities that had been identified in the first working group, together with uh, some questions to stimulate thinking and uh, feedback from the, the working group members on how we can uh, form up these priority areas. We will be taking the inputs that we receive today in the course of these discussions, uh, both quantitatively through the online polling and qualitatively through the open remarks and plenary sessions, and taking those uh, with the background document you've already received and creating a first draft of the policy brief. This draft will then be circulated to all of you in advance of the 5 June convocation of the working groups. The, uh, for, for, for the June meeting, we uh, expect to have the agenda focusing specifically on the draft text of that document, where we'll have the opportunity to hear from all of you on any areas that should be added, removed, refined, revised, in order to create a candidate final draft for then conveyance uh, to the Committee on Environment and Development in October of this year. This will sort of complete the loop of taking the, the technical work that these uh, sessions comprise to the intergovernmental level to build consensus on implementation. When the member countries give their feedback and consideration of that policy brief in the uh, CED in October, we will then reflect on those, use it to update the policy brief into its final form in the fourth and final session of the working groups of 2024 to create a document that represents both the technical inputs of this working group, uh, the political observations of the member countries, and uh, form the, the basis of the policy brief to inform SCAP and, and another work in bringing the, the regional action program forward in, in 2025 and beyond. So that's how all of your time and uh, inputs will be linked together through the technical and intergovernmental process to, to set the direction for the next steps on this. Uh, we hope to have all of your participation. Uh, this, these are open-ended working groups. You're free to leave or join anyone that meets your specialty as uh, may be fit. And we hope to receive a broad range of inputs from civil society, academia, and, um, and member countries in parallel to the political process. So mark your calendars. That's what we're expecting to do. Uh, in support of uh, those meetings, I would like to highlight briefly, I'm not going to go through each one of these, but these are some of the main analytical work products that we are expecting to release this year as uh, Environment Division in support of the Action Program. So we would uh, love to be able to work closely with experts and partners in the development of these uh, resources, uh, but please be aware that this is where our thinking is and uh, we'll be developing these materials in, in support of the process. And then on the next slide, simply the, the link into the intergovernmental cooperation with the submissions to, uh, to CED8 as, as I discussed earlier. So that's how the calendar and the work products and the knowledge products are all going to fit together for the remainder of 2024 and beyond. So I'm going to cut my remarks here at this stage with that you know, background and path forward established. We're all very much aware that uh, we've just had a good raft of uh, resolutions come out of the UNEA 6 process, some, some very exciting uh, mandates and consensus built there. Uh, and we're happy to, to welcome into the working group our colleague uh, Dana Crawhall duke uh, to uh, walk us through the main highlights of that process. Uh, we obviously want to work very closely with UNEP at the global and regional level moving forward, avoid duplication, enhance the synergies and all that good stuff. So without uh, any further ado, let's uh, give the camera over to Dana. Uh, would you like to advance your own slides and share your screen, Dana, or shall we? Um, thanks, Matthew. Happy to have you guys present the, the slide deck. 
All righty, over to you. Great. Thank you so much uh, to you and SCAP, uh, Matthew, the, the co-chairs of this event, as well as my colleague uh, from UNEP, uh, Mushtaq, for his opening remarks. We're really excited to be here from the Climate and Clean Air Coalition to discuss UNEA 6, which was a really exciting event, um, as well as some areas of collaboration and advancing regional air quality. Um, I'm also joined by my colleagues in this working group, uh, who some of you may know well and who have been part of, of previous sessions as well. So for those of you who don't know, just briefly, um, the Climate and Clean Air Coalition is a UNEP convened initiative and a partnership of more than 86 countries and just as many non-state actors seeking fast integrated climate and cleaner action to reduce short-lived climate pollutants, including black carbon, methane, tropospheric ozone, and HFCs at the intersection of science uh, policy and advocacy. Um, and just a, a bit of background, this presentation came from a, a meeting in January in Paris that UNSCAP attended in person on planning for a new CCAC initiative, the Climate and Clean Air Coalition Clean Air Flag which we're really excited about. Um, and since then, as has been mentioned, UNEA 6 has happened and the resolution on promoting regional cooperation on air pollution to improve air quality globally has passed, which is very exciting and very relevant in the context of the Clean Air flagship, uh, which was launched at COP28 uh, in its first iteration. So if we could go to the next slide, please. Thank you. So just a little bit of background, uh, the sixth session of UNEA or UNEA 6 was held uh, from the 26th of February to the 1st of March this year at the UNEP headquarters in Nairobi, Kenya, under the theme Effective, Inclusive and Sustainable Multilateral Actions to Tackle Climate Change, Biodiversity Loss and Pollution. UNEA 6 had many outcomes. It was a, a mammoth event, um, including a ministerial decision, 15 resolutions, two decisions aimed at halting the progression of the triple planetary crisis of climate change, uh, nature and biodiversity loss and pollution and waste. But for today, I really just want to focus on one of them. It's a big one, um, which has been mentioned already today. And this resolution um, is for promoting regional cooperation on air pollution um, to improve air quality globally. Um, so, Writ large, there's lots of stuff in this resolution, but um, it encourages member states to accelerate efforts to improve air quality globally, including by setting national ambient air quality standards um, and invites regional and sub-regional cooperation bodies and initiatives, as well as financing institutions to implement regional solutions to air pollution, particularly in developing countries. And it builds on previous UNEA resolutions, recognizing that air pollution is one of the greatest environmental health risks and that enormous potential exists through the multiple benefits that air quality improvement can bring from climate ecosystems and health, highlighting that regional bodies are really vital to addressing um, the air pollution crisis, including LERTAP, uh, FICAP, as well as the CCAC mentioned explicitly. So um, in many more words than I will say, the, the resolution requests that UNEP um, work with interested member states, specialized agencies, UN entities, including regional economic commissions to build and enhance national air quality monitoring capacity, including the use of low cost sensors of proper quality, passive samples and satellite data and digital solutions in conjunction with monitoring reference equipment. Um, and in direct alignment with the work of the Climate and Clean Air Coalition, it uh, calls for the support of the development of regional air quality arrangements, including an Africa Clean Air Program, which was also um, a recommendation of a CCAC UNEP African Union Commission um, assessment on integrated air quality and climate action in Africa. Um, it also requests very crucially that UNEP share uh, relevant knowledge, information, and expertise, best practices, interactive online tools, and data and air quality maps through an online platform. And I will come back to this very important point because um, this is something the CCAC has now started to work on in support of this resolution as well. Um, and the outcomes of this resolution are very fortuitous because, as I mentioned, the CCAC has launched its Clean Air flagship, um, which I'll get to in a second, which supports various aspects of the resolution, um, but most explicitly this knowledge exchange platform has been called for as a, as a key capacity gap that's been identified in, in air quality management. So. This resolution is very exciting. Um, it's the result of enormous political momentum building over months, um, including the CCAC um, official side event at UNEA, which supported the resolution, convening political leadership and partners with keynote speakers, including the UNEP um, executive director, Inger Anderson, representation from the Department of, of State of the United uh, States, the African Union Commissioner, Japan, Brazil, Dr. Maria Neira, Jane Burston, and many, many more. And it's really a reflection of the broad political support for the resolution that's been building over years in collaboration with partners, including the WHO, the WMO, um, UNICEF, and, and others. Um, if we could go to the next slide, please. 
Thank you. So I just wanted to provide some more um, information on the CCAC Clean Air flagship, which was launched at COP28, um, but it started at COP27 where um, CCAC partners, so state and non-state partners, really called to work together to develop a concept for a program of activities on cleaner action to launch at COP28, which did occur, as you can see um, in the photo on uh, the right-hand side of the screen. So the CCAC has uh, approved um, this as a priority area of work, and we have already started to develop this online um, tool and developed an ad hoc task team to develop the flagship led by some of my colleagues on the line as well as some of the partners here today um, with a meeting we had in person in Paris including UNSCAP, Clean Air Asia, the WHO, WMO, WRI and many others um, and there's an upcoming launch of this platform on Clean Air Day so a public facing launch will occur on Clean Air Day this year on September 7th um, which is very exciting and this launch will primarily be for the first iteration of this online information platform that's been uh, discussed as well. Next slide, please. So the, the vision of this flagship um, is really a three-year program of work from 2024 to 2026 that really will support many of the objectives of the resolution that's been passed at UNEA 6. Um, this uh, will be guided by the integrated framework of the CCAC on climate and clean air action, um, including saving lives, uh, clean air as quickly as possible, consistent with WHO air quality guidelines, these triple wins for air quality, climate, health, increasing acknowledgement of the climate benefits of air quality action and vice versa, um, as well as recognition of the impacts of air pollution and SLCPs on other factors, including agricultural productivity, economic development, the success of the energy transition, and as Matthew pointed out, also vitally gender equality and specifically the health of women. Next slide, please. Um, the goals of this flagship, so really, um, I cannot stress enough that the Climate and Clean Air Coalition is a, is a partnership, and really this flagship provides a strong vehicle for collaboration in terms of advancing this resolution, and there are five main goals of the flagship, um, and I'll go over them very quickly, but not read them. So it's to amplify and strengthen regional and multi-level governance and cooperation, to strengthen science communication, to support policy action and fill critical information gaps, especially on the focus of economic costs and benefits of cleaner action, which we know are huge, to elevate air quality agenda through advocacy, highlighting readily available solutions, including reinvigorating the Breathe Life Network um, with our partners previously mentioned, to promote the transparency um, and encourage private sector action on integrated climate and air quality management, and to mobilize finance for the air quality agenda uh, through this clean air flagship as well as um, other activities in the clean air sprint. We know that um, air pollution is a very underfinanced um, area and we're trying to replicate the success of the um, methane finance sprint in catalyzing uh, resources for methane activities, which was very successful at COP this year um, through a clean air sprint as well with all of you. Um, next slide, please. So we're kicking off activities with dedicated funds from the CCAC Trust Fund this year, um, including this knowledge platform, which I will not provide a, a deep dive into today. That's a separate presentation, but this knowledge platform called for now in the resolution will be a trusted resource for air quality monitoring practitioners around the globe containing Curating, uh, curated and up-to-date guidance for all aspects of air quality monitoring, including monitoring, emissions inventories, source attribution, impact assessment, policy planning, program implementation, and communications. And the platform will signpost the user to relevant guidance, tools, and co-benefit impact assessments based on their requirements and knowledge level. Um, and this tool is to be really developed in close collaboration with the CCAC partners under the banner of Breathe Life, which is an existing collaboration um, between us, the WHO, WMO, and, and UNEP as well. And a technical advisory group a tag of experts is being established to review and curate content for this um, ahead of a launch on Clean Air Day, um, um, noting also uh, the milestone of the WHO Global Conference on Air Pollution as, as on, and Health, which is upcoming this year as well. Next slide, please. So um, one more point on the, on the flagship is that this is the platform is the main uh, item that we're taking forward initially, but this will be a broad program of work, um, which will be envisioned over three years through these six kind of main pillars. Um, so to provide support to countries to fill these uh, capacity gaps in developing countries that have been identified through this resolution, targeting heavily polluted areas, least developed countries and cries for your regions, recognizing increased vulnerability, including through the development of clean air plans, regional roadmap sector strategies, um, NDC enhancement for uh, Black carbon as a key vehicle to leverage climate finance for air quality as well. 
um, also transformative projects. And I just wanted to highlight that we ha do have an open call for proposal right now that advances many of the priority areas of the flagship, including uh, the phase out of kerosene fuel subsidies and reducing black carbon from heavy fuel oils. Um, capacity building will focus on this platform initially to be accompanied with a workshop series for training and validation of the platform. We'll also have a political engagement and advocacy arm uh, focused on catalyzing finance for air pollution action um, and strategic ministerial convenings at milestone events um, and a cryosphere summit in 2025 that we plan to bring more political attention to cryosphere related issues. Science pillar focusing on the cost of an action assessment that the CCAC scientific advisory panel is leaving, um, leading, as well as science policy dialogues and briefs on air quality management, black carbon, um, and then also bringing in the private sector to catalyze momentum for finance from the private sector. Next slide, please. So I just wanted to leave you with a few, oh, sorry, one, one back. Thank you. Um, just a few takeaways from the outcome of the Clean Air Task Team meeting before I wrap up, because I think that this is really informative in guiding discussions um, moving forward. So um, this was a, a big meeting of many partners, but some key outputs were that um, a real acknowledgement that if this resolution is to be successful, there are real substantial capacity gaps, gaps that need to be filled um, in terms of financial resources, capacity among air quality managers across the globe, policy and regulatory ability, and more. So there's a real need to build this capacity, um, including through this platform, but also regional convenings and trainings to really empower air quality managers to succeed um, in, their, in their own countries and cities. There's also a strong need to strengthen regional bodies. This is really vital to tackling air pollution um, as the resolution recognizes, especially to house and implement strengthened air quality agreements on this transboundary issue. Um, on finance, we know that resources are limited. Air pollution attracts less than 1% of official development assistance, despite its enormous impacts um, on health and economic development. So the CCAC integrated approach can help us to tap into climate, biodiversity, gender equality finance. So the question really is, how can we best do that and how can we best do that together? At the same time, we know that the bulk of finance for implementation needs to come from the private sector. There needs to be coordination amongst donor bodies in the air pollution space to ensure the effective use of resources. And this is an area where close collaboration um, is really necessary as well. Next slide. And I end here, um, but I wanted to end on a question. So um, this is a partnership um, overall. and implementing this UNA resolution really requires close collaboration. So how can we best work together as a group to mobilize resources for cleaner action? Um, this includes financial resources, but also capacity, human capital, tools, best practices, existing forums for political momentum um, that can really help to advance implementation of this resolution um, and see the CCAC um, cleaner flagship as a vehicle to help us succeed in that endeavor. So um, I will stop there. Thank you very much uh, for everyone for listening and for inviting me to speak today and my colleagues on the line as well, um, Nathan and, and Scarlett from the CCAC Secretariat um, are also available if you have additional questions. Thank you. Thanks very much for that, Dana. Uh, this now concludes the introductory section of our program. We are within uh, five minutes of where we'd wanted to be. So uh, it, in, as a result of that, I will cut the next section by five minutes. <laughs> so uh, we will spend between now and uh, and 240 with an orientation to the substantive topics for this working group so we can get into the uh, interactive portion as quickly as possible. All of the materials that I'm about to summarize in my brief remarks have been circulated to you in the background document. So this is to help kind of juice our brains and, and get the right thoughts back to the frontal lobes to go have the, uh, the, the interactive discussion after this. Uh, the way we've approached the introduction to both the session on data and standards is that we'll have some brief remarks from the Secretariat on the framing of the questions and uh, then bring in a subject matter expert from the general community to provide their views uh, to catalyze the dialogue. Uh, so after those remarks, we'll start the interactive section, which will be quantitative, where we'll come to you with some structured questions that we intend to go through as quickly as feasible. Uh, and then an open floor for folks to uh, just raise their hands, unmute their mics, and give us whatever feedback they think would be beneficial to the process, which is what we hope will really be the beating heart of, of this session. 
Uh, so that's how we'll, we'll be conducting things uh, going forward, and, and I'll just uh, dig into the substantive content here as, as quickly as feasible. So I've, I've shown for you here on the screen how we got where we are with uh, the, the documentary process that led us here with the Regional Action Program, going to the high-level forum and its uh, recommendations. Uh, the first inception meeting that I know many of the people in this room also in, attended at which the priorities were selected and the uh, thematic expert group meeting on uh, data gaps around gender in, uh, in Suwon. So all of those documents are out and available. Do feel free to refer to any of them. Um, and uh, we'll be uh, pulling those together as we move forward with uh, the policy brief through this process. So I'd like to talk a little bit about the, the challenge at, the, at hand that we have for today to, to orient everyone. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll be re reviewing within the Regional Action Program mandate framework the priorities that were uh, set in uh, the first session of the working groups. So we'll be digging into specific questions on how to flesh out those ideas in, in the policy brief. Um, the version zero of that document is the, the background document that was circulated to you two weeks ago as, as we discussed previously. So, uh, with that in mind, uh, we're going to be coming at you with a lot of text. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about keeping the thread uh, throughout the slides as we're going through the uh, reference materials. If it's something that's a mandate that was established by the action program, which was the negotiated document with the member countries, it will have that icon. If it's something that's our own work product from the deliberations that we have been undertaking as a group, it will be marked with the, the working group icon. So that will at least help keep some of these, these walls of text a, a bit clearer. Uh, so with that being said, let's go straight into the working group on air quality standards. I'd like to just briefly acknowledge that in the inception meeting, we discussed and agreed on the membership and roles. Um, those terms of reference have been uh, adopted and were distributed as annexes to the concept note in the previous conveyance, so uh, this will apply to both working groups moving forward. In terms of the background here, uh, the, the key issue is the uh, diversity of standards at the, the national, sub-regional, and regional levels throughout the SCAP region. Uh, the member countries were very interested in having support for the enhancement of standards and the harmonization of standards at the national and collective levels to facilitate regional cooperation. So that's the, the, the centerpiece for uh, the working group on standards. Uh, the relevant portion from the regional action program, paragraph eight in this case, where they are not present, setting national standards, uh, and uh, as appropriate um, uh, implementing or improving existing national air quality standards. Um, this will obviously be guided by the work that UNEP has done in their global inventory of legislations, regulations, and uh, policies. Uh, and we heard from Eloise in session one on that uh, and uh, hope to continue that thread. So for the Regional Action Program, uh, section three, paragraph seven, observe the differences among the, di the, the member countries and the levels of uh, implementation and gave us a specific list of air pollutants that were uh, considered to be of concern to the to the SCAP member countries. So we're going to drill today into specifically how to take that forward in, in a realistic manner. Okay, so uh, the first recommendation that we had from session one was to uh, develop recommendations for regional harmonization on the guidelines. Uh, and uh, the, the narrative has been provided to you. So I'll just specifically move forward to the discussion points that we would like to uh, uh, solicit in particular uh, input from the group today. Uh, you know, member countries are demonstrating uh, wide variability in air quality standards that they have in place building on existing research, which aspects of air quality standards should be prioritized. We obviously can't bite off them all. So for this uh, policy brief and the trajectory of this work in 2024, which should we prioritize? Uh, so together with the measurement and reporting of specific air pollutants, we also have cases where individual countries set their own basket of indicators for the national AQI. Nothing wrong with that, totally fine. Uh, but we do also, in parallel to that, need to have uh, internationally comparable AQI standards for reporting of those basket indicators. So how do we go about that? So the second uh, discussion item under the Working Group on Standards uh, takes reference to uh, 
para 8, subsection D of the Regional Action Program, uh, which is uh, specifically around the compilation of best practices for monitoring air quality. How do we really do that? We see this come up a lot in the, the different circumstances faced by SCAP member countries. Uh, we were very pleased to see the uh, microsensors challenge undertaken under tropical conditions this last year, which was uh, very beneficial at identifying best practices that could be useful in our region, and we hope to see things like that uh, continue. So uh, for the, the uh, priority for this working group is compile best practices for monitoring air quality. Uh, and uh, the, the uh, point before us is how to give domestic guidance on quality assurance and control in the context of, of global practice for air quality monitoring. So with those uh, discussion points in mind for these two uh, quite weighty uh, substantive things that we've set ourselves as our priority, these are the discussion points that we hope to be turning over to the plenary to be hearing from all of you very shortly. We have uh, received already uh, a request for uh, taking the, the floor during the plenary session, which we will, be, we will be doing very shortly. But as I mentioned, we will now hear from our subject matter experts to give uh, their views on uh, this topic. Uh, so we'd like to have uh, Piranen from the Asia Disaster Preparedness Center now uh, take the floor and share his remarks. Uh, Piranen, if you're ready to share your screen, we'd like to go for, for five to seven minutes and we can do the slides or as you like. I can share the screen and can you confirm that can, you can hear me well? Lovely. Yes, uh, All right. please proceed. Uh, we're, but we're not seeing presentation mode yet. What about now? Yep, ready okay. to rock. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. So it looks like I have six minutes left, so I will not be... Um, taking a lot of time, just but as, as Matthew had said, I mean the the talk here is just to, to stimulate further discussion in the in a working group later on. When Matthew asked me to talk about the um, the standard working group here, I thought that the best way to do it is just probably just provide you with one example, and this is by no means the best example that we that we could present. There are a lot of other great works out there. But we thought that this fits really well with the intention of the working group as well as the RPAP um, um, in general. So let me just spend five minutes here to talk about the program called Severe Southeast Asia with the main component on air quality monitoring for sustainable landscape and better human health. And this is the work supported by USAID and NASA implemented by ADPC. Of course, we are talking about air pollution here, but I think to really convince uh, decision makers that this this is some real problem that they have to take actions on. I think we have to look beyond just air pollution. We have to look at the impact of it, particularly on health as well as socioeconomic um, impact of the pollution. At the same time, to really address the problems, pollution itself is not the main problem, but the source of it. And um, in, in Southeast Asia, at least the source of air pollution came from fire. So we, we brought in the other sectors on land management and forestry sectors also to to be um, to to come up with solutions together. So just in a nutshell, the actions that we are trying to take here, and again, this fits almost perfectly with the wrap up that um, Matthew had presented before, we try to enhance capacity of uh, key stakeholders in the region in the region to be able to monitor air pollution, but at the same time realizing that technical capacity alone is not going to lead far. We want to also raise awareness of decision makers on the importance of air pollution monitoring and actions that can be taken to address it. We want to also uh, open up the sharing of information and data through development of either a new tools or enhancing existing tools, make it very user-friendly, make it accessible to anyone to use. But at the same time for sustainability, we, we want to integrate our work here, uh, which is a project, but we want to in integrate into existing or new regional platforms or framework or programs to really for, to sustain the work going forward. And one of the... Um, one of the regional platforms that we were looking at was ASEAN, of course, but also the, the RAPAP. So 
what do we do just to um, recap very quickly on what we did before we develop an application, a mobile application that used satellite data to, to give information continuously over the region. In the past, you may have to rely on ground data, which can be spotty and can be scarce in many other areas, but we fill the data gap by um, putting satellite data to to uh, allow everyone to know about their air pollution condition at any location. But as I said before, the source of air pollution came from the other sector. So we, we help and um, pilot some of the works with Thailand before on um, addressing the source of pollution. First is Smoke Watch, which is the, which is the application where you can uh, detect fire and then try to put off the fire before it spreads too far and creating uh, pollutions. But the other interest, interesting one is Burn Check. This is uh, applicable for uh, the agricultural sector, which is the main source of air pollution in Thailand, at least. Uh, the idea is to use this app to look into the future forecast of pollution and then use that as the deciding factors to determine whether uh, the government can allow farmers to burn their residues. They will be allowed to burn if the condition is right, but if we, are, we expect to see pollution in the next few days, then they will not be allowed to burn. This is a way to manage uh, burning rather than uh, banning it completely. But as I said before as well, that we should look again at the impact of um, air pollution on health and use that as a means to increase awareness of stakeholders. So we look into uh, correlation between the level of pollutions, PM2.5 to be exact, and impacts on, on human health, on the respiratory disease, eye disease, and other uh, impact that could be a deciding factors and use as a guideline uh, to set up the standard for um, danger, danger level for uh, air pollution. But all in all, we look beyond the project itself, right? We have to support existing cooperation, transboundary, or working between countries to, to bring up, to set up the standard, to increase data sharing, but also the knowledge and lesson learned. So we are trying to do that uh, first as in the first spot between Thailand and Laos PDR, but we look forward to adding other countries. And at the regional level, we try to work with the ASEAN as well as UNSCAP here on implementing on oper operationalizing the RAPAP. So I hope I did not take too much of time. Um, I will be in this uh, working group discussion as well as my colleagues here uh, as well. And you are well, also welcome to take a picture of this screen and go to the website where you can get more information. So I'll leave it at, at that. Hopefully this will get everyone start thinking. Thanks, Piran, and that, that was great, very helpful. Uh, at this stage, I'd like to uh, remind participants that if you would like to uh, take the floor during the open plenary, uh, please signify that in uh, either the chat box or with the, the raise hand function so that we can manage the, the requests in a, in a suitable way. Uh, likewise, uh, we'd, we'd now like to start the uh, quantitative uh, section of our uh, open, open session today. Uh, we're going to use a tool called Mentimeter, which you can you, uh, allows you to answer certain questions either directly on your phone or on your PC. Uh, we've put the link to the Mentimeter in the chat. If for whatever reason your session is interrupted, you can just click on that and, and get right back into it. Uh, we'd now like to get the uh, QR code on the screen. So for those who would like to scan with their phone, uh, please do so now. We'll give you about 20, 30 seconds to pull that up before we, we dive in. Uh, we have a, a set of uh, quantitative uh, questions to go back and forth with the group uh, and hope to have the, the bulk of the session on uh, open discussion during the plenary uh, in the order that uh, request a speaker received. So with that being said, I'll now uh, turn the mic over to my colleague Kelly Hayden, who will be guiding us through the uh, quantitative uh, session as well as the, the open floor. Uh, so, uh, Kelly, let's uh, put 30 seconds on the clock and then over to you to lead folks through the, the items. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, and Thank actually, you. just as a just as an aside, uh, SCAP staff will not be uh, answering the questions because we're, you know, secretariat servicing to the working group. We're not members, <laughs> but we do hope that all the rest of you will. We do want to hear from our UN uh, sister organizations, civil society, everyone else in the chat is very welcomed to uh, respond. Mm -hmm. So over to you, Kelly. Yes, thank you very much, Matthew, and good, good afternoon, everybody. Um, 
uh, as Matthew said, that uh, uh, if you could log into the Mentimeter, this is just a way to collect some of um, just some of the initial results and thoughts from everyone in the in the um, in the meeting at the moment on the actual discussion points. Uh, we will then move into the actual plenary for this standard group on uh, working group on standards um, to have a more open discussion. Um, so if you could just click on the link or and add that code, at, which is at the top of the screen there. Um, yeah, and uh, we have a timer on. So whenever we're ready to start and join the, um, move to the next slide, I'll let you go. Okay, so the first point is um, the scope of this particular, um, it, it's, this is to do with developing recommendations for regional harmonizations of guidelines and policies on air quality standards. Um, and so the scope of this particular uh, point is to, um, based on national needs across the region, identify countries which may be candidates for cooperation of, of this nature, so of who may want to join in a regional harmonisation of guidelines um, and accordingly provide technical cooperation upon request and within existing resources for countries to improve. So basically what we like to do is have you add your um, you know, countries that should be sort of included in this particular scope for harmonisation, uh, regional harmonisation of guidelines and policies and air quality standards. So if you could just start typing in um, into the Mentimeter and we'll give you a few seconds to do that. Um, Great, we have one in Nepal. Um, any, we have a few countries um, actually in in the meeting today. Um, I know we've, I've seen Laos, I've seen Thailand. Yes, here we go. We're getting a few more in there now. Republic of Korea. Yep. Nicole. Okay, Central Asia, yeah. We have um, quite a few air sheds here, which are going to be very important for these regions or sub regions. Okay, I think that perhaps. Okay, people are still typing in, so I'm going to let it go for a few more seconds. <laughs> okay, the island countries. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're getting a lot of specific um, uh, regions, obviously the um, um, ASEAN region, um, South Asia, um, Central Asia, so we have quite a few sort of um, examples here. All right, so perhaps maybe we can move on to the next slide or the next question. Um, so just yeah. to clarify for participants, yeah. at this stage, the system is taking all of the responses received and giving uh, the participants the opportunity to vote on which ones uh, have the most uh, support. Uh, so mm -hmm. you now have the chance to basically vote on the proposals which have been made. Um, obviously, as the Secretariat, we'll go through this and where uh, you know proposals yeah. might be different only in phrasing, you know, we'll combine yeah. those votes. <laughs> Mm 
Okay. I think we've got everyone's vote at 16 people. 17, that's good. Okay. Okay, we can we can certainly compile all of these and as Matthew said, um, some of them are uh, some of them are kind of uh, duplicates, so we will um, add them together or sort of smooth that out later on. But thank you very much, everyone. Um, maybe we can move to the next slide. So anything to remove from the scope? Um, and let me read the scope out to you again. Based on a survey of national needs across the region, identify countries might, which might be candidates for cooperation of this nature, accordingly provide technical cooperation upon request and within existing resources for countries to improve or establish national air quality standards. And this is for develop recommendations for regional harmonization of guidelines and policies on air quality standard, standards. So I've seen developed countries allow, do you want to be removed from this um, scope? I'll leave it up a few more seconds in case anyone else wishes to vote. Okay. So this is to remove from the scope. Um, okay, perhaps we can move on to prioritizing this. Um, yeah, please might note that the removal, the this is basically removing um, whatever from the guidelines or whatever the, you know, policies for regional recommendations, the regional standards. Have we left adequate times? Yeah, okay. Okay. Assisting regional cooperation. Okay, we might have to clarify that a little bit more um, later on. Okay, so Okay, could we move on? Please. Okay, this one's fairly self-explanatory. What pollutant or which pollutants should be prioritized for the development, adoption, or enhancement of national standards? And if anyone's experiencing any problems or whatnot, um, please let us know either in the chat or
Okay. I think we've exhausted our votes here. Particulate matter is obviously very important. Ozone, um, NOx, then followed by sulfur dioxide. Okay. Thank you very much, everyone. If we can move on to the next item. So collecting information on national commitments of member um, states on clean air, um, including goals, targets, sectoral plans, etc. cetera. Um, and the information should take into account agenda dimension. So compiling and analyzing information on actions taken by member states and stakeholders in support of clean air, such as the good practices. And the information, so that is the actual scope of this particular set of questions. So if you could add to that, um, what information on national commitments from member states would you like to see included if it were to be gathered together? Best practice practices in monitoring air quality. So, so if you can start just adding kind of, you know, your ideas that come to your mind. Um, should it include targets? Should it include existing policies um, that, you know, that could have a specific focus? Um, what would be useful for you in terms of successful case, uh, case studies, um, you know, to share between various countries or, you know, existing policies? Yep, standards. Okay. Okay, enforcement mechanisms. Monitoring network designs, that's a good one. Interesting, yep. Okay. Okay. Very practical sort of recommendations there. Right. I think we have some really interesting um, examples and responses here. So if we can move to the next slide and um, allow you to prioritise again, implementation support. What do you think is sort of going to be more important than others? There's quite a few things to vote on there, so I'll give you some time.
Okay, we've got quite a few votes there now um, so that we can have some discussion. Um, I think we can move on to the next, okay, poor and vulnerable policies. Okay, sustainability, accent, cross-sectoral scope. Okay, very interesting. We perhaps can come back to some of these issues during the discussion. Um, maybe we can move to the next slide. Um, again, this is actually to remove from the scope. So we're talking about, again, collecting information on that national commitments, member states on clean air, um, uh, compiling and al analysing information on the actions taken by member states in support of clean air, such as good policies and practices. And um, so is there anything that you think should be not collect, basically? Anything that should, you know, that's not necessary? <laughs> well, that's straightforward. I'll, I'll give it a few seconds in case there's any more... Uh, comments. <laughs> All right, that's fair. Okay, then maybe we can vote on those. Okay, so we get a little bit of time for the actual discussion. Um, perhaps we can move on. Everyone's finished getting their votes in. All right, everybody said it's all good. Okay, um, except for one person. Yeah. Okay, the next one. There's two more prioritization slides, and these are quite straightforward. Um, what topics should be prioritized? Air quality management policies, technology, financing, business. And some of you have already picked up on this on the uh, when you were typing in earlier, but we'd now like you to vote on out of these particular ones. Um, what? How would you prioritize them, please? Okay. Thank you very much. And finally, the sectors that you think are the highest priority or the lowest in, in this regard. It's with respect to air pollution standards or you know, collection of information.
Okay. All right. All right. We're still voting. <laughs> Sorry, I will move on to the discussion in a second, but we're getting some very interesting results here. Okay, if we can finalize this um, or conclude the Mentimeter part of this, um, this discussion. Um, what I'd now like to do is actually move into the plenary uh, discussion area. And we do have a um, we do have one request for an interve intervention from um, Mr. Bert Fabian from EANet. So I would like to pass the floor on to him first. Um, and after that, please, you are most welcome to um, add your request to speak either in the chat or raise your hand. Um, and we would very much welcome your thoughts on this topic. Okay, so. But I'll pass it over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kelly. I'm Bert Fabian, a coordinator of the Secretariat of the ENET. ENET is one of these uh, intergovernmental bodies on asset deposition and air quality management. It started way back in 2001. Just uh, maybe some uh, uh, contributions to the discussion. Thank you very much to ESCAP colleagues for organizing this meeting. And I'm really actually hopeful because there are so many participants uh, from uh, relevant organizations, this issue of air pollution is very big. And uh, it's not only really about the standards, the monitoring, uh, the data itself, but really the cooperation, right? But going back to the uh, discussion points in terms of uh, the standards and looking at it, there are probably many studies out there already on in terms of uh, what the countries in Asia Pacific have in terms of standards. Most will be based on the WHO air quality guidelines, as we know. However, maybe something to look at is how the countries go from interim target one to four and reaching the air quality goal, sorry, the air quality guideline itself. Uh, because I'm sure there are many countries that are stuck in interim level one, interim target one uh, and two. Having said this, uh, INET also compiles uh, uh, air quality management information for its 13 participating countries. We are updating the information this year or we should start this year. And these are all information approved by the 13 participating countries. And as such, uh, especially during this time that we're updating it, including the standards, we would be happy to, to share with uh, uh, our colleagues in ESCAP and also widely. Another issue on the standards, I looked at the ranking. Of course, particulate matter is very, uh, very, very important. Haze, uh, this is what we always see. But I'm also thankful that you now have polymatic, uh, sorry, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. Some are uh, VOCs, the volatile organic compounds. ENET is also looking into this because there are very few countries in Asia Pacific that have ambient air quality standards for VOCs. And in some cases, it's getting very important. 40% of uh, waste that is burned is plastic. This emits uh, vinyl chloride, which is also very harmful to health. Uh, INET is working in uh, 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 the Philippines, Mongolia. The Philippines wants to develop its own ambient air quality standards for some VOCs. Thailand apparently has ambient air quality standards for 17 uh, VOCs, including vinyl chloride, benzene, etc. So again, this is something perhaps that INET can contribute to the uh, discussion and support. Perhaps I stop here. I'm sure there are many other uh, issues and other colleagues may be able to uh, contribute. Thank you very much again. Uh, thank you very much for that. Um, but um, yeah, I we have one request for um, from Professor Elo Eloise Scottford to actually take the floor. Um, and again, please let us know if raise your hand or um, you know, write in the chat if you'd like to speak on any of the matters relating to the uh, air quality standards. Um, thank you, please, Louise. Thanks, Kelly. Um, I thought, uh, you know, you, you've asked a very specific question about which aspects of air quality standards should be prioritised. Um, and you've also got the question about air quality indexes. 
I have thoughts on that, but maybe put that to one side for the moment. But just on the the aspects of air quality standards to be prioritised. Um, Bert just made a really good point about ambition, which I think is where the discussion often is about, um, you know, uh, and moving from interim to the air quality guidelines over time, um, if we're taking the WHO guidelines as a reference, which I think we should um, and we must because that's the best evidence-based uh, reference point. Um, and I think thinking about which standards, which pollutants uh, to think about, you know, how to develop those pathways to ambition is really important. But I wanted to flag a different set of um, uh, uh, kind of aspects of uh, air quality standards that I think do still need to be prioritised while that discussion around ambition, it's often where the politics is, it's often where the kind of the push is to get the targets which are focus minds and, and, and really set the direction of travel. There is a risk if all the discussion is around ambition that how you achieve that ambition and building in frameworks for the how gets a bit left out of the discussion because it's just, you know, people who work in air quality management know how important that is, but it's the less kind of interesting stuff politically. Um, so the kind of the aspects of what I would call the kind of governance framework that need to be prioritised as well as having air quality standards of adequate ambition or a route map to getting to that ambition over time. Um, and this is, you know, the, the work that I've done with UNEP on looking at air quality legislation around the world, uh, kind of the, the research we've done, there's a real risk that you can have air quality standards in law, which, you know, that's what this um, program of work is heading towards as well, that are kind of bare standards that then aren't uh, enforceable in any way. And I think it's that piece around implementation enforcement that needs to be in there from the outset. So a couple of points in that governance framework that I think are really important uh, to have on the table. One is, it might sound quite simple, but it is, I think, incredibly important that the public health objective of those standards is built into the legal framework from the beginning. And that's because there is a real risk that in the implementation of standards, they might be traded off against other interests uh, or other priorities, um, you know, most classically economic or development, whatever it might be, but however you understand development. But I think having that public health objective really connected into what those standards are uh, in, in the governance or legal framework is super important. Institutional accountability for those standards, someone has to be responsible for delivering them. I know you know that. Oh, okay. 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 Oh. I think that might just be someone with a mic on, <laughs> not necessarily a conversation. Yeah. Um, Thank, you. Um, Thank you. Yeah, so someone and normally an aspect of government, if not uh, government generally, being institutionally accountable for those standards. And that's to mitigate against the risk of kind of bare legal standards. No one actually is responsible or accountable for achieving them. And you'd be surprised how many legal frameworks don't have that accountability so they can sit there, but no one actually has to deliver them. And that, I think, whether you attach sanctions to that or not, which is, you know, it can be really tricky in different countries, but at least there just needs to be a body, a bit of government, a bit of normally perhaps the whole government, responsible for delivering those standards. And that goes to then um, one of the points that's already come up in the Mentimeter about structuring coordination of policymaking, because often uh, air quality standards are not achieved because different parts of policymaking are not coordinated. Um, and who is responsible in government for achieving those standards can really structure how uh, uh, you get coordination of different parts of policy making in governments to achieve those standards. So that kind of institutional accountability piece really matters. Another thing that is super important to pre prevent the ossifying of standards over time is to have review mechanisms built in uh, because we keep learning lots of things about air quality standards and we will come up with, the, you'll come up with a wonderful set of kind of the latest, but having that process for reviewing standards over time. Um, and then two more things thinking about access rights for the public, a big, big dimension of uh, environmental governance generally, but particularly in relation to air quality standards. And we see this coming up at the moment. We see it coming up through litigation now a little bit, not as much in the climate change space, but and certainly in Southeast Asia, where 
you know, people uh, know to understandably frustrated about levels of air pollution and want some accountability and don't necessarily have roots into kind of governance systems. And that is a much more efficient way and effective way of, of involving the public in um, in air quality standards that they can participate in the setting of standards, in this, the making of plans, uh, they have access to information and all of that stuff. Um, and then the final point that is really tricky for governance regimes, but I think it speaks to a lot of the points that um, even have come out of UNEA 6, is, which is very difficult, is how you have, um, and it, you know, it's what regional agreements are, are, are kind of beautifully designed to do, but really how you have the joint working across uh, um, borders for uh, um, for working on trying boundary air pollution. It's kind of the holy grail, but that needs to be legally designed in a bit. So that that would be my kind of suggested wish list of the aspects of air quality standards to be prioritised, which is, I know that's not just like, that sounds like a long list, but without some of those bits, just having lots of ambition, even if you get there, may be a bit of a pyrrhic victory. No, there are some very valid points there. Thank you, um, uh, Elise. I've, um, and I think that uh, some of that started to come up in, in the responses to the Mentimeter. I think there were questions about enforcement or, or comments about enforcement and, um, and and things like that as well. And it's a, yeah, it's a, a very common problem that, okay, you can write a piece of paper, or write a standard, but you've got to be able to enforce it. You've got to have the data to do it. You've got to, um, the whole legal side's a very different aspect. Um, I'm just, so I want to really hear um, from other people. Uh, we have a lot of people here, and I, I don't want to go over time, but I might ask to go a couple of minutes over if I could. Um, would anyone, I'll just invite you now to just take the floor if you'd like. Otherwise, I will ask a question also. So uh, Kelly, just to come in on yep. a logistical uh, perspective, notionally, we've uh, set ourselves to 320 for the working group on standards. So we're just about on that time perfectly, uh, unless there's yeah. anyone else that wants to take the floor, I think we can proceed on to our next section. Okay, okay, that's a problem. I've, uh, I will pass it back to, um, we're gonna close this session and I will pass it back to Matthew then to take control for the moment. Okay, great, thanks very much. If we could go to the uh, slides. Uh, and, and I realize I just reflected on us being more or less on the time. Uh, that being said, with the list of speakers that we do have and, and the wealth of information that we have coming up, I'm going to make kind of a, a last minute decision to, to greatly curtail my remarks on the uh, substantive background for this session. Uh, hopefully that is going to suit us fairly well, but if we could just go directly to the scope for data sharing slide. I'll comment briefly on that, and then we'll go over to uh, Adam for his remarks. There we go. Yep, back one. Scope for data sharing, please. Okay, so the, the main uh, core of this point of intervention is that we have uh, the goals for getting member countries and scientific organizations and all stakeholders sharing their data openly and freely. Uh, and that's kind of getting the data into the, the public domain. In parallel to that, we're hearing from you know stakeholders across the spectrum of the desire to have a kind of repository for that data to make it accessible and useful and drive towards uh, policy action and, and action to actually reduce air pollution. So those are some of the aspects that are within scope of this working group. And, and when we get to the, to the Mentimeter section, we'll, we'll go through those uh, systemically. Um, that being said, I did want to take a, a few seconds to highlight um, this analysis, which I think sort of frames where we are in the, in the data ecosystem globally on this particular point with, with open data sharing. Uh, so with the, the hat tip to the folks over at OpenAQ for the, the fine research work that they've done in this regard, I wanted to, to highlight briefly the basically proportionality between the uh, countries that are collecting 
uh, data and the countries that are that are sharing data. And we can see that within that uh, rubric, there's been uh, four elements proposed for um, analyzing and, under, and, and understanding um, uh, how accessible that data is. Um, and it can be noted that sort of the steepest drop off that we have among countries with monitoring networks that are collecting their data is the programmatic access. That's where we really kind of fall off the cliff if, uh, in terms of data that's being collected being uh, uh, accessible in a, in a useful way. So uh, as we go into uh, the, the Mentimeter and we're thinking about data warehousing portals for the data, and we're thinking about repository platforms for storing policies and actions and commitments and things like this, we'll be asking for your feedback on what the shape of those sorts of priorities should look like as, as we go forward back to, back to the member countries. Uh, so in that portion, we've kind of given you a we're trying to hit the, the Goldilocks just right zone. We'll come to you with, with three kind of level set proposals of whether or not it's best to just have a, a what you see is what you get kind of file repository where stuff goes in and uh, it isn't really analyzed or cleaned, but it's made available for researchers and sophisticated analysts to deal with versus uh, some level of data validation versus uh, a, a really strong analytical product like we may have seen with uh, with the Servier Mekong folks and, and the stuff that they're making available. So I will curtail my remarks there and let's then go directly to hear from uh, Adam, who will be speaking to us on the amplifying communities of practice dimension and providing his perspective on what we have and where we should go. So Adam, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matthew. So uh, again, thanks very much for the opportunity to, to talk about our experience on communities of practice. Um, we know that gaps in data standards and practical air quality management guidance are some of the biggest barriers to effective air pollution management. Uh, despite the availability of low cost sensors, satellite data and modeling to inform policymaking, there are many places in the world where data on air quality simply doesn't exist. And it's nearly impossible for policymakers to legislate reduce air pollution while blind In late 2022, a study by Global Health Visions in partnership with UNEP and Killian Air Fund surveyed environmental officials, academics, and air quality management practitioners working across 119 countries and found less than a third of the countries had successfully implemented air quality monitoring networks or had air quality management strategies. Practitioners cited the lack of technical capacity as one of the greatest challenges faced by air quality management practitioners, second only to insufficient funding. And surprisingly, these technical challenges were reported as bigger barriers than any lack of political support or authority to implement programs. This kind of technical gap is compounded by poor alignment among agencies, institutions, and partners providing air quality management guidance. Individual agencies' fragmented approaches can lead to unnecessary duplication of resources and, at times, conflicting information. And the cross-cutting nature of air pollution as a health, environmental, and climate issue means it often falls between the cracks. So to improve the availability and understanding of air quality data, the U.S. Department of State supported a program with the Research Triangle Initiative in collaboration with academic institutions in Laos, Thailand, and Vietnam, to deploy a network of low cost air quality sensors. However, we experienced challenges in convincing some local experts and policymakers of the reliability of the data, even when it was calibrated against reference uh, grade monitors. And without accurate and trusted data and agreed upon standards, policymakers uh, can't effectively mitigate air pollution through legislation and regulation. It's challenges like these that led the U.S. to work with partner countries to introduce the air quality resolution discussed by UNEP colleagues earlier at UNEA 6. Uh, we were extremely pleased and encouraged that UNEA 6 in Nairobi concluded by calling for this global framework for regional bodies to address air pollution and with a resolution to develop a global knowledge sharing platform and regional cooperation to tackle air pollution. We welcome this landmark resolution and urge governments to mobilize more funding for this much needed platform, especially for data collection, and to promote more robust regional coordination. We fully expect this new global platform will promote regional cooperation to improve air quality, building on 
the momentum created by SCAP's Regional Action Program on Air Pollution. So to feed, feed into the establishment of a new global uh, UNEP air quality knowledge platform, the U.S. has sought opportunities to increase, increase its support for regional resources to improve air sheds. Um, in September 2023, the State Department announced a partnership with SCAP to launch a project to develop a methodology for improving air quality and air sheds spanning multiple countries. This new partnership, which is the first such U.S. funded program uh, with SCAP in recent years, is expected also to serve as a model for the implement impl implementation of SCAP's uh, Regional Action Program on Air Pollution. Another U.S. effort to build regional air quality data is our Servier Southeast Asia program you heard about already from Piernan. Servier is now working with partners to enhance its existing satellite-based products and to expand them to cover other countries in Southeast Asia. And in a coming year, Servier Southeast Asia will also support the ASEAN Secretariat in its member states to impl implement the roadmap on ASEAN cooperation towards transboundary haze pollution control. So with so much work being done to improve regional knowledge, resources, and expertise in air quality management, we're looking increasingly for opportunities to build and harmonize communities of practice, to leverage this past work, and to avoid the duplication of efforts. More specifically, we're looking for opportunities to grow our regional networks. We believe regional frameworks provide a natural mechanism for coordinating donor assistance for air pollution initiatives, ensuring external resources have the maximum impact in creating sustainable paths to achieving clean air. The the State Department has an ongoing program with the World Resources Institute on strengthening air quality communities of practice in Southeast Asia. The project uh, brings together air quality practitioners from Indonesia, Malaysia, and the Philippines by working to strengthen existing air quality forms in the region. Uh, WRI's air quality management framework, adapted from their lessons learned in implementing communities of practice in Latin America and Africa, is now being applied to fit the needs of Southeast Asia. Their air quality management framework works to strengthen the technical capacity and networks of air quality experts in the target countries. It also supports the regional sharing of experience on air quality management and provides guidance to stakeholders on using existing and previously implemented tools to enhance their actions on clean air solutions. So we now hope to leverage the communities of practice convened by the WRI Communities of Practice Project as a resource to inform and enhance SCAP's efforts to develop a methodology for improving air quality in air sheds spanning multiple countries. We believe that these regional communities of practice can contribute to the dialogue, a dialogue among transboundary air sheds on establishing common data standards on collecting, accessing, and using high quality data, conducting impact assessments, and on credible source attribution analysis. Growing regional communities of practice can also help us adapt developing air quality guidance to local contexts, languages, and cap uh, capacities. Uh, they can help adapt air quality management guidance developed for high resource, right, re high resource settings for their more effective use in low and middle income settings where access to equipment and capacity levels may be very different. Uh, with this in mind, the U.S. is also looking at opportunities to further extend uh, the community of practice work being done in Malaysia, Indonesia, and the Philippines into the Mekong subregion, where we continue to build uh, on our previous work to uh, increase local trust in the low cost sensor net network deployed through our previous research triangle initiative pro program. And as with the WRI program, growing Mekong communities of practice could serve as a resource to inform and enhance SCAP's efforts to develop a methodology for improving air quality in regional air sheds. We would encourage similar broader efforts to help communities of practice work in greater harmony across projects and across countries. All of this work from the UNEA resolution to high-tech satellite data to building networks for air quality practitioners is intended to strengthen collective regional understanding of the importance of air quality and of effective measures to improve it. We hope our shared efforts to build robust regional networks of air quality practitioners and stakeholders can eventually enable and inform strong regulation and legislation at the national level. Thanks very much for your time. Back to you, uh, Matthew. 
Thanks very much. Uh, just a few uh, housekeeping reflections on, on time and pacing, as we do have uh, two designated uh, speakers already on the list for this session, uh, Chris and Sarah. Uh, we're now going to hear briefly from my colleague Anshuman, who will be, who will be speaking to us about one of SCAP's platform development uh, efforts, uh, which we hope to take forward in, in harmony with the, the efforts from uh, UNEP on their, on their global platform. So as part of this, we'll have a, a few minutes set aside for uh, filling out this form, and then we will go to our uh, speakers list, uh, our Mentimeter. Thank you, Anjuman. Thank you very much, Matthew. And and uh, I, I think this flows well from uh, you know the the discussions that we've just heard regarding uh, uh, you know development the proposed development of a global knowledge platform. Uh, so uh, you know I think as was outlined earlier under the regional action program, uh, you know there are five uh, action areas that have been uh, outlined on uh, air quality management, uh, data uh, air quality monitoring, data sharing best practices, capacity building, and multilateral cooperation. At the same time, RAPAP uh, under Para 6B um, also has the provision to establish an open regional platform uh, for the exchange of information and best practices uh, on air pollution challenges and solutions. Um, so with uh, it, uh, in, uh, in fulfillment of this provision, um, uh, SCAP, uh, we are currently uh, in the process of initiating uh, you know, a, a new project. Uh, and uh, uh, this project uh, is being financially supported by the Clean Air Fund uh, graciously. And uh, the, the objective of this uh, platform uh, really is uh, to strengthen uh, multilateral and uh, uh, multilateral uh, cooperation and coordination under RAPAP uh, by promoting information exchange. Uh, and uh, particularly aimed at plugging existing uh, knowledge gaps that uh, may exist in uh, ongoing efforts towards uh, clean air. So uh, you know, the, the vision of this uh, proposed uh, uh, you know, partnership and coordination platform under APAP uh, is to provide a repository of collaborative work uh, and uh, showcase uh, elements like uh, the national commitments that exist out there, what are the goals, quantified targets, and sectoral plans out there, uh, what are some of the regional and multilateral cooperation plans that are uh, offering support to these national commitments, and also what are, for example, some of the clean air actions uh, uh, that are uh, underway. Uh, particularly uh, from the point of view of uh, regional, sub-regional, or multi-stakeholder uh, cooperation uh, uh, efforts. Uh, so with this background, you know, we would like to do a short survey, since this is a working group meeting, you know, we'd like to give, you know, add some li little bit of additional work. Uh, so, uh, you know, we'd like to show, do, do a short survey to gather uh, information on four specific uh, questions. Uh, I'm requesting my colleagues to uh, move on to the next slide, which shows a, a QR code. Also, I'm requesting colleagues to post this link for the survey uh, on, on, on the chat. Uh, the uh, idea is, uh, you know, rather than a Mentimeter poll, you know, to do uh, a, a, a forms survey, which can, uh, you know, collect some uh, qualitative data as well. And just in case, uh, you know, although I think we can take a few minutes, let's say for five minutes to fill up the form, in case uh, you need uh, additional time to consider all the options, you know, you would have the opportunity to even submit this uh, after the, the end of the meeting, uh, uh, hopefully today. So uh, if you access the form, uh, I would request uh, participants to please uh, scan uh, the, the, the code or to visit the link. Uh, you'll find uh, four uh, short questions uh, that, that are there, uh, which are uh, you know, seeking information on what you perceive as the most important information or knowledge gaps constraining regional co or transboundary cooperation on air pollution. Uh, that's one. You, you'll see a set of uh, choices that uh, you know out of which we request you to pick the top three uh, from your perspective. Uh, another question is about uh, you know what functions in the platform uh, you think would be most useful uh, for uh, promoting for building regional cooperation and partnerships and clean air. Uh, also, a couple of, of uh, other questions. For example, what information sources you uh, currently uh, visit more often, uh, and you know they could serve as great uh, you know references for us to, as as we proceed with the development of this platform. And finally, any other thoughts and suggestions that you may have 
uh, for uh, for us for uh, building a strong uh, repap partnership and coordination platform so this is uh, uh, you know the the quick ask from you so maybe we could pause for uh, four to five minutes uh, Matthew if you have time and then you know hopefully we can collect uh, responses but uh, just in case you feel you need more time please feel free to also fill it in uh, uh, or complete the submission after the the meeting uh, but hopefully by by the end of the day today so maybe we'll we'll pause here at this point so we'll uh, resume further at 3:40 Yeah, sounds good. Thank you. Uh, we'll resume in one minute. Okay, thanks very much for giving your reflections on what the SCAP platform should look like. We'll uh, give due consideration to all of these inputs uh, in coordination with our UNEP colleagues so that both platforms can uh, go forward in a holistic manner. So that being said, we would like to get to the plenary section of the working group on data as quickly as possible. Uh, in this regard, I think we've all uh, um, gone through our learning curve with Mentimeter. So for the upcoming questions, We'd like to give one minute per question. Uh, we should therefore conclude the quantitative portion of this uh, session of the plenary within about 10-12 minutes uh, and then we're over to our speakers list. 
uh, and then open floor. So with that being said, we've got the, the link and the QR code here. So I'll turn the time over to uh, my colleague Kelly to walk us through the uh, Mentimeter prompts uh, and, uh, and get to our speakers list. Kelly, take it away. Thanks, Matthew. Um, yeah, as, as Matthew said, uh, we will go through it a little bit uh, more quickly this time. Um, the Mentimeter link is in the chat if you got uh, had a problem um, uh, reconnecting after the last the last session or something. Uh, but otherwise, we will start on uh, the first item, the scope, and this is to do with the working um, the working group on data. So the first item we're going to look at is in parallel with in parallel to national air quality index practices, provide recommendations for regional reconciliation, um, harmonization into an approach which can be used in a transboundary context and establish a consensus criteria for reported data sharing uh, approaches. So that is the general scope that what we're dealing with here, which is related to enhancing international cooperation among monitoring networks and air pollution observatories, utilizing uh, remote sensing and ground monitoring stations. In that regard, can we move to the first point? And you might want to add some thoughts of what should be included in that scope. So in parallel to national air quality index approaches, um what provide recommendations for regional harmonization into an approach which can be used for transboundary well, in a transboundary context for data if you just want to add in some comments or some points thoughts long-range pollution. Mm -hmm. um, so what kind of data sharing approaches would be uh, valuable in this regard? Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we've had almost a minute now. Oh no, we've got a couple more coming in now. All right, we'll give a little bit longer. Obviously it took a while for everyone to log in. Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. Open data, very important, that one. Okay, perhaps we can move to the next slide where we will, where you can, of course, um, vote. Okay. Okay, the quality of source apportionment, availability of trends in air quality measuring processes. Okay, that's a good point. Okay, so if we can move on to the next slide, which is what items don't you want included in this? Uh, if you can have any thoughts, I'll give you a minute to Think of that. This is relating to international cooperation. 
among monitoring networks and air pollution um, observatories utilizing remote sensing around monitoring stations. Um, recommendations for regional harmonization into approach, an approach which can be used, be used for transboundary. If anyone has any ideas that they don't want covered. All right. I think it's, oh no, we do have a, okay. Okay. In case there's any others, um, I don't think there will be, so we can move on to the voting page, but there's only one thing to vote on, so. Yeah, I think in this case we can skip the voting. One skip candidate. It. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a bit of a okay. So this I will pass over to you, Matthew, because this was uh, an additional question you added. Thanks. Yes, just with re reference to my earlier remarks, this is our effort to try to put a sense of. Uh, low, medium, and high in terms of the level of sophistication of a data sharing uh, platform and, and what that should include. If it should just be a, a file repository, what you see is what you get. Uh, some level of validation and metadata or something that is sophisticated and providing analysis and conclusions and links to policy and, and all of that sort of thing. So uh, if you're UN fairy godmother visited you in the night and gave you one wish, which one of these would it be? Okay, I think we've got roughly most of the votes in, so perhaps we can move to the next. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, criteria for data sharing to be prioritized. So um, reporting direct measurement of pollutants, station specific coordinates, um, timely fine scale temporal information, programmatic access, all equally necessary. Okay, that's fair. I'll give you a few more seconds in case anyone wants to, to add. Okay, I think our minute is up. Thank you very much. So this one is um, basically, you know, how how can we support communities of practice? You know, considering COVID left us uh, pushed us all online, um, what do you think is a best work, uh, best way of working? to get the most of a community of practice. So webinars, training workshops, hybrid working groups like this one, um, 
expert group meetings tend to be more um, in-person research symposiums, online in-person conferences. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, everyone's tired of online meetings, it looks like. All right, thank you very much. We've got one more item to go through and then we'll um, invite some speakers. Okay, final scope. With reference to the functions identified in item one and in view of the existing efforts, and we've heard some of those efforts so far in some of the presentations from um, different agencies. Should SCAP develop a digital platform for sharing open air quality monitoring data, et cetera? This one's a pretty specific um, uh, scope or question for you. So um, perhaps the next slide is if you could give some ideas of what you would like to see. Should we have something? Should we use another agency? Um, what would you like to see in it? You know, how expansive should the platform be if you do want it? Okay. a good point. All right. I see the responses have dwindled a little bit. Oh no. Um, what would be the purpose? Who should be the users? That's sort of something that you should probably um, identify. Uh, that's something you can put forward for us. Okay. Um, let's stop this question here and we'll move on to the prioritization. Okay, I think that's probably most people have voted. Okay, that one came out clear. All right, next point. Uh, anything not to include in this particular scope, you know, with reference to, you know, whether ESCAP should develop a digital platform. Uh,
So you don't think that direct data collection should be included? Just to be clear, this is not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's fair. Okay, I think that's a uh, four points there. Okay, we can move on to voting. Oh, no. Mm -hmm. Perhaps we can move on to voting for these ones. Okay, I think we can close this one. No cost sensor does not read ready. Okay, that's fair. All right, last last Mentimeter question. Um, oh no, this is a new one. What actions should be taken? Just to contextualize, this yeah. is uh, in response to, uh, we want to give an open-ended opportunity for participants to express uh, freely what they would like to see SCAP do in a platform construction for open data specifically. Okay, so we'll give you a minute or something to add some comments in there. Mm -hmm. um, even if you wanted to repeat a comment you put in an earlier um, slide, you might as well go to add that. Okay. Uh, my timer says a minute is up, so if we can move on to the next slide and. Okay. And vote.
All right, that's about a minute. Thank you very much, everyone. Okay. That's some good, very good input there. Thank you very much. Oh, we have each. Okay, fair enough. We have reached. This is concluding the Mentimeter presentation then. So now we can open the floor for um, any discussion points you'd like, anything you'd like to raise. Um, I will note that we have a couple of people who have already said they've wanted to make an intervention here. Uh, so um, Chris, and I do apologise if I pronounced your <laughs> name wrong, but Chris Borgabuma. Um, the Executive Direct Director of Open A AQ. Uh, you're the first one. So over to you. Thank you very much. Good day, everyone. I do have a presentation to share if possible. Um, let me grab that. Can you see? Yes, we can. All right. So OpenAQ has been mentioned earlier and was referred to in the materials. We are a, a US-based uh, NGO, that, but we work internationally to collect data from across the world. Um, sorry, my slides are not advancing. So basically, we are the world's largest open source air quality data aggregator and harmonizer. And uh, we currently have data, actually this is a little bit outdated, from 153 countries across the world and are collecting criteria pollutants from both reference monitors and to some extent air sensors. And the very important role that we're playing is that we're aggregating all of this data into a one-stop shop that the data has been harmonized for easy use by folks. These data are used by a wide variety of folks, primarily scientists and researchers and analysts, but a number of others across the world to in, basically improve our quality. Uh, it, it, they enable the science and research, raise awareness and understanding, and help support solutions development. We not only are a data aggregator, but we're working to build tools that help people access and use the data, even if they're less technically savvy. We also upskill uh, folks, uh, young professionals around the world. This was our most recent community ambassador program. You see several folks from the Asia Pacific area. This slide was, uh, this was referred to earlier. This is our data landscape report that we completed in December of 2022. We're in the process of doing the research to update this report and the numbers, but I'll skip this since we already referred to it. And likewise, uh, we talked about these, the, 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 um, what is maximally, maximally useful data it's the data that meet all four of the criteria that were discussed earlier. When we looked worldwide, we found that um, evidence of only 40% of countries worldwide even monitoring for air quality, among those only a small group uh, shared those fully maximally with the public. Uh, in fact, that was less than one quarter. So I thought I'd look at SCAP members. So I looked here at members in Asia Pacific plus one associate member, because we only looked at uh, territories with more than a million folks. And uh, I looked at then, so this, the, the number here is 50 countries plus Hong Kong. And we found, this was actually very similar to the, if you looked globally, we found that there's, evidence of current monitoring in 64% of the SCAT member countries, and therefore uh, no current monitoring in 36%. And then we looked at this issue, I looked at the issue of the data sharing and found that only three countries uh, are, are sharing data in a maximally useful way. Three are not sharing at all. And then, then there's the variety in between. I then looked at OpenAQ and found that we have one or more currently active reference monitors 
So not a US embassy monitor, but a reference monitor in that that is being um, supported by that government in 16 of the countries. And we have historical data from reference monitors in three of the countries. What I mean by historical is that we had data at some point, but then those countries are either no longer sharing data beyond their borders or are just sharing less data in general. And then just finally, I, I, I won't go through the slide at all, but these are just, there are a number of benefits to governments of, of sharing data openly. And these are just a, a few of them. Increased innovation, collaboration and trust, equity, increased trust in the government itself, justification of the inter interventions that the government uses and more uh, improved information flow within and among governments. I will leave it at that because I know we're short at time, but thanks for the opportunity to share. Um, thank you very much, Chris. Um, we, we still have uh, a bit of time. What I, yes, Matthew? If I could uh, d divert from our dance card a little bit uh, and while we have okay. Chris with us. I was wondering, Chris, if you might speak extemporaneously to us a, a little bit about the uh, validational steps that OpenAQ takes on the incoming data that it is it receives in support of those analysis. Like what what how does how is the sausage made? <laughs> so we are also unique in the sense of so many countries are sharing just an, an air quality index, right? We are sharing the real time data. So we don't, we do not do quality control, quality assessment ourselves on that data that is up to the, the individual or organization that is working with the data. Um, we do plan, but that's actually essential. You, if you're going to share real time data, you have to, you have to, to then also provide the metadata that that government is sharing. And that is the, the important thing there is to be working with the governments to ensure that the what they're putting out is high quality. From the reference monitors, that's generally going to be true. I also mentioned that we do capture some air sensor data and, and that's just sort of user beware um, and understanding that air sensor data is not going to be as high quality. That said, we are planning to build more basic quality assessment tools into the into the platform so that folks who want to use those are able to. Okay, great. So uh, I'm understanding that particularly for the, the the sensor tier, it's in the sort of what you see is, is what you get kind of uh, paradigm. Uh, it therefore suggests to my mind, I wonder if it's kind of a, a chocolate and peanut butter solution there that we were seeing a lot of support for a data sharing protocol to be taken forward by SCAP under this agenda item. It seems like the work of OpenAQ could be uh, enhanced if the folks sending you data were doing so under the rubric of a protocol that addressed some of these quality uh, aspects. Is that uh, a reasonable idea? Any, any obvious flaws with that idea? It is certainly possible to um, do some sorts of, manipulation is not the right word here, but there, it is possible to do a certain amount of uh, quality control before releasing data. What I think what I'm trying to get at is that once data is released and sent to us, that's what we share with the world. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, mindful of time, uh, Kelly, I'll get off the mic <laughs> and we can proceed with our speakers list. Thank you so much. No, that's fine. That's fine. Um, just before we move on to the other next speaker, um, any other comments? Anyone else want to jump in there? Uh, please feel free to make add it into the chat or put your hand up. Okay. Well, then uh, for the moment, um, I'll move on to Sarah Bassard from the Global Atmosphere Watch Program of the World Meteorological Organization. Um, I, okay, I, 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 will, I will share my screen if, if you don't mind. Yeah, that's no problem. Okay. Uh, Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the invitation. I don't know if you can see my screen now. It is supposed that this is the presentation. 
Thank you. Yes, we're getting your screen and it's in presentation mode. Please proceed. Hello, uh, my name is Sarah Azard. I'm scientific officer at the Wolf Meteorological Organization under one of the research programs that we have here in the, in the agency that is this Global Atmosphere Watch program that is dealing in atmospheric composition, global information. Basically, the GO research program is trying to work for enable atmospheric composition services and is based on the partnership of more than 100 countries, including con many contributions from research community and universities and academia. Also, one of the core activities of the program is, this ma is that is maintaining and applying long-term systematic observations of the chemical composition and related physical characteristics of the atmosphere. And here we want to stress what maybe it was mentioned in the previous discussion on the quality assurance and quality control. And we have to stress that because GO is dealing with global assessments, then the quality assurance and the quality control of the data is one of the pillars of these activities. And we are doing all this work to really deliver integrated products and services for relevance uh, of relevance to the society. GO is contributing to conventions as the Long Range Transport Pollution Convention, Paris Agreement and Montreal Protocols, but also is contributing to activities on human health and food security connected with the WHO and UNEP. Also, we are working a lot in climate change mitigation strategies, promoting a greenhouse gas monitoring infrastructure or a greenhouse service platform that is called IGIS. And also we are dealing with the design and provision of warnings connected with air pollution, fires, or sun and dust storms. And this is the current observational research infrastructure that as you can see in the bottom of the, of the slide, you can see that we have GO stations recognizing, cover, uh, recognizing different representative uh, scopes like global, regional, or local, but also we are working with contributing networks that are ingested in this system that currently now has more than 300 sites around the world. Also, as you can see in the map, there are regions that are more dense, uh, uh, dense covered by different type of stations. And we have some regions as Asia that maybe uh, needs more covering for, for, there are more gaps in a special representativity of this continent. Then we are also working a lot in the integration of other sources of information coming from modeling, new technologies as local sensors, satellites, but also national air quality networks, which is the main core activity of, of open air, for example. And here we want to stress what means integrate, because one of the one, one of or important activities as a technical agency in United Nations is to provide advice and expertise. And we are also doing some reports on best practices. And this is, for example, the last published report on local sensors. And I want to stress here that we are doing a lot of efforts to explain to the community the limitations of certain instruments and technologies for specific activities and, and scopes of work. Then in that case, you can see that uh, the community is trying to include all the sources in uh, of information possible to support air quality management strategies. And uh, we are planning a new uh, report for this year, just keeping the loop of, of this news. And when we talk about quality assurance in the WMO program, we are having a complex system that is beyond uh, the training of the personnel. Also, we are trying to assess of the infrastructures, operations, and the quality of the observations at each of these sites. We are documented all the data that is submitted in our world data centers that are publicly available to all the community and all potential users. And also, we, we work a lot on the improvement of the quality and the documentation of the legacy data, meaning that we are keeping an archive of data that now is a span more uh, than, I think, that is more than 30 years. And you can find all the information in the associated website of WMO. And with that, just I want to thank you, the time and the invitation to the meeting, and don't hesitate to contact us if you need any further information, but I want to stress here that the, the scope of the program 
is go into global assessments and have this standardized and harmonized data that can be used for any region of the world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, this is very interesting points on the work that you've been doing there. I'd like to ask just, uh, we've had a request for someone to speak, but I'd just like to ask if anyone um, specifically has questions related to that last presentation. If you could raise your hand or unmute yourself or whichever one you prefer. Okay. No, I think uh, I think we're all quiet here. But um, it's it's good to know there's so many other different initiatives and things that would possibly sort of, you know, work together quite well, um, available. Um, also, also, just a stress that we are supporting air quality management strategies, but our goal is to really assess the impacts on climate uh, on climate. Uh, yeah. Yes. Scopes. Then I don't know if in your discussions you are also going to this type of discussion and also assess the contribution of, of the big cities in, in the ESCAP region on these oh. climate change discussions, you know, because if everything is focusing in urban uh, in cities, oh. sometimes we are missing also these regional and global assessments that are needed for different purposes, also connected with their pollution sometimes. Oh. Just yeah, to leave you the, the point of discussion for, for future. No, that's a good point. And um, actually, I think one of the earlier possibly understand it. some of the questions we asked people were around what were the sectors we were focusing on and obviously um, you know, transport came up as a high one you know agriculture is also a very important thing this also is more... cli climate change climate yeah. change strategies uh, yeah, should yeah. be also considered in these discussions and it's yeah. because of that that I, I cannot hurt this morning anything connected with climate change strategies and, and air pollution which is intrinsically yeah. connected yeah i i do understand um and maybe matthew might want to pitch in here but it isn't specifically we've been very specific on air pollution um you know, uh, ambient air pollution issues though there are certain elements of um uh, obviously climate change which are very much linked to it um but at this stage, at the moment, I think there are separate there's separate work going on with regard to the climate change. Um, do you want to add anything, Matthew? Or sorry to put you on the spot. Well, I, I wish there was a more elegant answer. <laughs> I can only give the accurate answer. But I mean, Sarah's obviously uh, raised two very important points. Um, I'll start with the one that has what I hope is the best answer, which is that uh, certainly from, from the Asian paradigm, particularly from a human health impact paradigm, uh, the story of air pollution is uh, largely centered on the urban question. Um, in that context, uh, the way we need to go with that is in an airsheds perspective, where we are enabling local action on air pollution in a context of the inherent interrelationship in the shared environment between those cities, the rural areas, uh, all, all of these kinds of aspects. So ESCAP is very much investing and, and focusing on uh, taking a, a uh, perspective of local empowerment in a context of cooperation. Uh, and that's uh, where how we are trying to um, uh, attack this, uh, this point that you've uh, very aptly raised. And we look forward to, to working with, with all of the members of this body as, as we do that going forward. In terms of the climate change air pollution integration, um, this is one where there's a certain uh, set of perspectives. Uh, I'll start with the one I like most, the scientific, <laughs> where the you know the, the integration between climate change and air pollution is just profoundly inherent all the way down the stack. You know, short-lived climate pollutants, black carbon, CO two, NO two, acid rain. Uh, you know, all, all of these. It's they're in, uh, the the level of overlap <laughs> in the scopes is nearly one hundred percent. 
um, you know, I'm very pleased that, that, it, that at SCAP, both of those teams live in environment division. And you know, we all are, are across the hall from each other and, and we do collaborate uh, quite closely on those. Uh, in that context, the other half would be the, the political, where we do hear a diversity of voices on this. I'm pleased that after the arduous negotiations for the regional action program, there are clear comments in there on the links to climate. Uh, so we do have that ink on the page and we're very happy to see it. Um, that being said, uh, the, the political climate is such that some stakeholders and member countries um, are willing to engage on both climate change and air pollution. Others are not willing to engage on climate change, but are willing to engage in air pollution. So uh, as an intergovernmental organization <laughs> advocating for science-based policy, we have a bit of a square peg and a round hole that we're very much uh, putting a lot of thought into trying to navigate. Um, uh, so you're going to hear about methane, you're going to hear about black carbon, you're going to hear about CO2, you're going to hear about sulfur, <laughs> and we're going to tackle all of those. And it's going to be under the Regional Action Program on Air Pollution. Yeah. <laughs> and hopefully point, the result will point, be You know, we clean. have to go beyond, beyond the W2 uh, parameters sometimes. Then this is the comment that uh, Sometimes in the if you want to build a, a nice strategy for future, maybe it's good that you consider a broad picture beyond the five pollutants that, or six, if you think in particular matters too, that are currently in the WHO guidelines because there are more things, as you said. That's this is the comment. Yeah. So, uh, to the best of my knowledge, this is uh, uh, the the end of our. Uh written list of speakers, although I note that uh, the HEI is, is up next. So I'll use this opportunity to make a brief housekeeping announcement in that we encourage all members of the working group to also take advantage to send us any written feedback, which they may have uh, in either track changes on the guidance document or emails or you can call me at my desk, whatever you want to do <laughs> for the next two weeks, at which point we will need to uh, put a hold on further inputs as we create the next draft of the policy brief that will be coming back to all of you for review. So if anyone out there would like to write me a memo <laughs> on how to untangle this aspect, it will receive, as the member countries like to say, the fullest consideration. <laughs> so with that being said, I'll close my mic and I think we have a, a Pallavi next, is it? Yes. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, so moving moving to the health aspect, I believe, uh, Palavi Pant from the um, Health Effects Institute. Um, you had a few comments you'd like to add. Um, please, you'll join, take the floor. Um, thank you very much. Yeah, I just wanted to add two points to the discussion. I think the, the first one is just to re-emphasize um, the importance of including metadata and you know whatever work that SCAP is going to do with countries, especially in providing guidance to the extent that that can be encouraged and standardized. It would help not only in sharing of the data more broadly, but also when we start thinking about applications in the context of health in particular, those types of um, information are really relevant in deciding what data um, and from where do we use for any kind of health studies or health impact assessment? So I would strongly urge SCAP to consider how um, improved metadata practices can be um, encouraged across countries. And then the second point I wanted to make is just to go back to the question and topic around air quality indices, which um, of course are a way that many countries have been using um, to, you know, share information and to make it more accessible. But I think in, in this context, uh, my sense would be to try and focus more on the raw data, which is the concentration data, if we're talking about pollutants directly. Um, A, because it's, you know, those are more standardized. You're always measuring these pollutants using the same methods. Um, so the numbers will be broadly comparable if you're looking at monitoring stations in one country versus the other. 
And then um, second, in you know some instances when there where there is hesitation to share data, um, countries can resort to sharing AQI type information, which is not as helpful if you're trying to do health studies or um, you know policy impact analysis, etc. So again, from the point of view of application of some sort of harmonized data, keeping the emphasis on the concentration and raw data would be really helpful, again, both for transparency, because it's the easiest, um, you know, easiest data that we can all look at. And having that type of data readily available makes it easier to do health assessments and other types of um, policy assessments and also, um, you know, look at what's changed over time, which is harder to do with AQI type um, values. So I would just say maybe staying focused on concentration information would be helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that's some very valid points, actually, for, um, uh, yeah, particularly for research, you really do need a lot of detail background. So, um, yeah, it's something to be considered when looking at platforms. Uh, other platforms may be doing, uh, you know, more technical sort of uh, work which can support this. How can we share sort of this technical, uh, the metadata, et cetera? You know, what, what's existing there at the moment? Um, I wanted to just make a, uh, add or read out a comment um, to from Patrick Vuka, I believe. Um, my impression is that international funding, including, for example, Germany, is increasingly focusing on the links between air pollution abatement and climate change mitigation. So to only focus on air pollution is potentially limiting funding opportunities. That's a very good um, point. Um, you know, I think we did mention that, yeah, there are, there are uh, Matthew was mentioning, there are reasons where we're just focusing on the air pollution side at the moment, but it's very much linked with the climate change side and there's work going on on, on that side as well. Um, yeah, that's something to consider, though. Another one, I agree with Pala, oh, sorry, from the Stockholm Environment Institute. I agree with Palavi, make sure raw data uh, is reported, difficult to use or access air quality values. Yes, that is very true um, for research publications, etc. You really do need a lot of background document uh, data. So there is a important thing come out there. Would anyone else like to take the floor, um, throw, add some comments in, um, you know, add, add something into the chat? Oh, there's a hand up. Nathan. Yes, please. Good afternoon. Good morning, all. Um, I <laughs> Matthew, I'm not sure I'm in a position to write you a memo in the next couple of um, weeks that would uh, be <clears throat> transformative in any way, but I, I, I do want to um, throw my weight behind what, what Sarah was mentioning, and I think it's a, an ambition that we all have. Um, understanding you know, we, we on the UNEP side understand just as well, um, you guys on the SCAP side, the political realities of what we're grappling with. Um, and, and I think you, you said very, very, very well, sort of what the, what the scientific perspective is on this. But I, I, I think, I mean, the reason I raised my hand here today is to give a little bit more perspective. Right now, there are quite a few international bodies on both sides of the, uh, the one atmosphere. Um, ecosystem that are grappling with this issue of how to what of the politics more than anything <clears throat> of integrating climate and clean air you've got the LERTAP community actively talking now about uh potentially amending the Gothenburg uh protocol uh to include methane you have the IPCC community their task force on inventories there in the Asia Pacific region talking about um, how what the scope of this new uh, this the new guidelines that they're going to develop on SLCF inventories will be and whether or not PM 2.5 itself should be covered in those guidelines. Um, 
all of them are coming from their very specific perspectives, right? One from the air quality side, one from the, the climate side, but they're all, uh, we're all grappling with the exact same issue basically in real time. And uh, there, there does need to be a way, understanding the politics, um, that, that we do continue to push on this issue um, and, and elevate it. And I, I would be very happy to be engaged in, in a discussion about that. As I said, I'm not sure I'm in a position to write a, you know, the, the magnum opus memo in the next two weeks that's going to change everything. But, but, but all of these pieces are moving hopefully slowly one step at a time forward, right? And, and it would be, I think, a disservice if, if SCAP was not also, you know, out or uh, the RAP app was not also out front uh, showing that it was moving in a stepwise fashion in that direction as well with, with the rest of them. And maybe together as a community, um, we can, um, you know, make, make a stepwise progress forward. Um, I, I mean, I know that's 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 front of mind for you, but but I, it is worth, um, I think, pointing out all of these other communities that are kind of pushing, you know, ten, you know, tentatively pushing on this issue. And I think they, you know, together we might feel that we can be a little more robust um, and 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 forthright in 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 the effort of uh, a one atmosphere approach. Yeah, thank you for that, Nathan. That's a that's. Some very good points there, Matthew. Did you want to say something? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, th thanks, Nathan, and and well noted. I I think we've uh, <laughs> pulled this audience to death. I appreciate all of your patience. Uh, but a thought is is occurring to me in the context of this particular exchange that I wonder if we have space under the amplifying communities of practice uh, recommendation that has been selected as a priority to take forward, if we included in that analysis the recommendation that uh, amplifying communities of practice on air pollution should include amplifying the communities of practice on climate change and, and synergizing and harmonizing between those two groups. Um, I'd like to, to ask uh, Nian, could you please put that as a chat, just type that idea in the chat that amplifying both communities of practice and then anyone in the working group who agrees with that as a path forward, if you just put a like on that comment, would help us get the temperature of the room if we should be putting some more thinking into bringing those communities together under that priority. Uh, so I'll just close there. I see we have some further re requests to take the floor. So back to you, Kelly. Uh, yes. Uh, sorry, do we have a hand up or we've got um, Mr. Amir? I see your camera is on. So would you like to say something? Support that. Do we have any? You're welcome to just sort of um, take the floor if you have to, if you'd like to add something else to the discussion. Okay. I'll just no. also indicate that I think we've received an enormous richness of, of feedback yeah. in, in this session, and we're very yeah. grateful for how many people who have joined us and stuck with us and yeah. given us yeah. such strong inputs. So, you know, yeah. it's no no great crisis <laughs> if we adjourn slightly ahead of uh, schedule. So we'll yeah. give, uh, you know, 30, 60 seconds for anyone else to uh, request the floor, and then we'll move to the close. Okay, I will... Um... Um, I see a hand going up, Mr. Amir Abbas. Mohammed, are you actually wanting to take the floor? No? Okay. Okay. 
Okay. Well, I think we're um, we've exhausted ourselves. So perhaps uh, you know we can move to just summarising and and taking forward some recommendations. As Matthew mentioned, please write to us, um, contact us with any additional points. Um, there is a lot going on uh, globally, regionally um, with, with some of this. So the more we can avoid duplication or um, specialise kind of uh, something for the Asia-Pacific region, um, uh, the better, obviously. So please, um, in the next couple of weeks, uh, we, we more than welcome your input, particularly from our country participants as well. Um, yeah. So on that note, though, I will pass the microphone back to Matthew. And thank you very much, everyone who joined in the conversation and voted um, tonight. I do appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, great. Yeah. Likewise, uh, we'd just like to thank everyone for joining. We appreciate all, all of these valuable inputs. As we indicated, we'll have a two-week period for any further written inputs as we turn around the next draft of the uh, policy brief for your considerations before the third session of the working group in June. Uh, so thank you very much, and we look forward to further collaborating with you on the path forward. Thank you. Goodbye. Oh, I am reminded by the team. Oh, dear. Uh, we do have a meeting evaluation. <laughs> thank you, colleagues. Thank you. Uh, yes, if you would please uh, uh, give us your uh, views on the uh, organization of this meeting. This one's brief. It would be appreciated. But if you could do that, thank you very much.